Okay, I'm going to do a little more on uh, some more details on Dr. Charles Morton's life. And I have two pieces of information I'm going to start with that are a little more comprehensive than the rest, and then I'll go through some other scattered about things I happen to have uh, near me. Uh, the first thing is, is are the memoirs of John Tatlow of um, Crover County Cavan. Um, that was written by him that ended up um, in the hands of uh, Anne Emery's daughter, I think, or a uh, descendant of John Tatlow, and ended up being actually put in the Vancouver archives. I have a transcription of the original. I've never had the chance to see the original, um, but uh, the details in this transcription uh, ring as being true, at least in my mind. So I'm going to go in here, I'm going to look inside this, and basically the general story is that John Tatlow uh, was a nephew of one of the individuals that was an attorney and, um, and uh, managed the financial affairs for Dr. Morton in, uh, in Ireland at one point. <coughs> And um, I'm going to read some interesting parts that I fa that I found here that I, that I um, highlighted. And the most interesting, one of them, there's a lot of interesting parts in here, but one of the more interesting things with regards to uh, Dr. Morton's ancestry, although um, most of the researchers believe that um, Dr. Morton's Irish estates or he was able to get them after he married Mary Savile. Um, there is contradictory evidence towards that, and that you know when I've read the um, the Lumleys of Lumley Castle, you know, uh, just as a reminder, Arabella, Arabella Savile, Savile married Richard Lumley, and then he had, I think they had three children by that union, and um, in the um, in that book she transcribed some original records and one of the original records that have to do with um, with Dr. Charles Morton is that you know they didn't exactly um, that, that George was George Savile is in the process of divorcing Mary Pratt and also well, while he's alive but in addition to that it seemed that there is an implication that um, Mary Pratt had actually Received uh, George Savile as to how much he was able to actually bring into the marriage. Now, Mary Pratt had married George Savile uh, when Charles Morton was six years old in 1722. <laughs> and, you know, she lived until, I believe, uh, 1791, if I have this right. Um, I'm going to look at the record here. Here I'm running um, Family Tree Maker in um, Linux, invented Linux here. Uh, their marriage was in 1767. She died in 1791, but her first marriage was to um, George Savile in 1722, and then she married Thomas Wallace in 1744, and that's actually the exact parish there, St. Margaret and Lothbury. Okay, and then he died before 1766, as far as I know, and then she ended up marrying Charles Morton. Okay, and also maybe I'll give you a visual of <laughs> what makes sense about who Charles Carr's father may or may not have been, and actually the account that I'm going to read in here is going to make sense uh, when it reconciles with the evidence, and unfortunately I don't really think that Charles Carr was his natural son, um, but only DNA is really going to sort this out if we get you know a match with most of the Mortons that are, that are in England, then... Um, there are two distinct DNA lines that are coming out of the Mortons. You know, we're going to know that he was adopted. And that, that'll, that'll seal the deal. Or if there aren't any, if all the Mortons match up, then we know that John Tatlow was right. But um, anyway, I'll get to that. Okay, so he was saying that um, uh, this is John Tatlow talking about his uncle. And I guess to get a little bit of, I'm going over the place, but to get a little bit more of. Um, I have the mother of Charles Morton is unknown, unknown, but really it probably should both be unknown, unknown. 
Here's Charlotte Tatlow and John Tatlow here. This guy right here is this is who wrote this journal that I have in front of me. And he says he has an uncle. And so uh, could have been Anthony Tatlow. No, that'd be his brother. It'd be um, William Tatlow here. And he died in 1815. So this John Tatlow is his father, and this is the subject, John Tatlow, who married Aunt Amory. <coughs> and so John Tatlow here is saying, My uncle had been in Ireland in the summer of 1799 to value an estate of Dr. Morton, and on his return advised the doctor to send over somebody to reside on it and manage his affairs there. Okay, so now when I, when I, see, the, when I see the word estate, being a CPA, the first thing I think is Form 706, and someone died. But a uh, state could be used more broadly in a genealogical sense, and that could mean that it's just holdings or land holdings. Now, I'm looking at the, the year here. It's 1799, and let's, okay, let's go down here, and let's find out when Dr. Morton married um, Mary Pratt. And that was in, actually in 1767. And also up in the... Um, <coughs> The archives in the Irish National Library, there is amongst their preserved items um, one uh, deed that both Charles Morton and Mary Pratt had signed at one point. So, now why in 1779, this is 12 years after Mary Pratt and Charles Morton were married, why at that point would there be a difference in Charles Morton's estate? Well, I'm almost asking the wrong question in a way. It could be that um, John Tatlow's uncle first was employed in 1779, but his acquisition of those estates were a lot earlier. Now, we think about the Pratt family. Again, uh, Mary Pratt's father, John Pratt, which I'll show up here, who married Henrietta Brooks. This individual here is the first individual that's ever cremated in England. I don't even have an exact birth date for him. And I'm not even sure if his father was Joseph and Eleanor. I think I've got the things <laughs> sorted out properly, but I'm not sure. I do know that Mary Pratt had two brothers that died <coughs> in du Phoenix Park in Dublin in 1723. Nonetheless, this John Pratt did have, um, I'm not even sure if that's the right birthplace, it may have been in England, he did have a um, important presence in Ireland. He was the vice, pre vice treasurer of Ireland at one point. <coughs> And there was some kind of um, question about what he had done with his money, but still, he would have. He he predeceased his wife, uh, Henrietta Brooks, who had a very very large will that she wrote in 1769, basically to cover all of her siblings. And quickly go up there, you can see there are 19 children between Mary Waller and John Brooks, her multiple parents. A lot of them lived, and a lot of cousins survived, and that's why she had so many beneficiaries. But uh, John Pratt here, um, he was dead before she died in 1769. She died in 1769, so her death really didn't necessarily trigger much. It only bought a few more years, and, yeah. and also Henrietta didn't even mention Charles Morton in her will. Uh, <laughs> after... Uh, or her, or her daughter, actually. Mary Moore didn't even mention that in her will. She may have mentioned Mary Saville. I should take that back, but I know she didn't mention Charles Morton, who was at the time married to Mary Pratt, uh, two years prior to uh, Henrietta Brooks' death. So I'm really trying to figure out, and right now, preliminary, I do have a John and a Gertrude, and this Gertrude appeared somewhere up in, in Ireland, and there is a, a death date, but I'm not so sure that that's actually the right <coughs> set of individuals. I really, I'm not so sure. Um, <coughs> so most of the time when I put my family tree together, I only put things in there that are substantiated in, unless I'm looking into experiment. I have in my own mind what is experimental and what isn't. And even this, the birth year for Charles Morton, uh, 1716, I do have. I do have an IGI record for that. But, um, and it, I do have him as the son of John, and that does match up with what's in the Dictionary of uh, National Biography. But the problem is I don't have a 
a stronger connection than just the Dictionary of National Biography asserting it. They do have it in place for now, but I may find that that, that comes untrue, and it may not have been at St. Peter Church in Liverpool, Lancaster County. Uh, but it is been said more than once without substantiation that our subject, Charles Morton, was born in 1716. But I am going all the place, I'm digressing, but the deal is that um, we're trying to figure out you know, why in 1779 all of a sudden would uh, John Tatlow's uncle suddenly need uh, John Tatlow to go to Ireland. Um, not sure. Okay, so let's, let's see what else they say here. I believe my uncle intended to fill the place himself, and there was a treaty on foot between the doctor and him about it. But my aunt's dislike to it, and his own affairs being likely to be settled <coughs> as to enable him to stay comfortable, comfortably in England, induced him to change his mind through without informing the doctor of it. My uncle's acquaintance with Dr. Moore, Morton was through Mr. Whitehurst, who never missed the opportunity of serving any of us. It now struck me the day after I resolved to leave yelling that I could not dissolve of myself better than by becoming Dr. Morton's Irish agent. I mentioned this to my brother who argued uh, against it from the disagreeableness of one being so far separated, but after considering the case in every light we put to it, he became convinced that it was the most prudent thing I could do and advised me to write Dr. Whitehurst, Mr. Whitehurst uh, instantly about it in case of my uncle declining to Mr. Whitehurst had said there was another person <coughs> wished to have it. I therefore wrote to Whitehurst that instant. Okay, and then on the 18th of February, Whitehurst wrote me an encouraging letter relative to the prospect of going to Ireland, and later in February, Uncle called on me on his way to London as they were going to settle matters respecting me with Dr. Morton. Okay. So, yeah, there's actually more. Okay, on the 4th of March, I received a letter from my Uncle requiring my immediate presence at London, where I went the next day, and the following morning, he, <coughs> he and I waited on the doctor at the museum where we spent the day, and it was agreed that I should go to Ireland as his land agent with a salary of 70 pounds Irish per annum. The next day I returned home completely happy to be able to tell my wife I had found a place to shelter. Okay. And a few days after my uncle returned over, he's... He stayed one night with us, and it was thought necessary by the doctor that he should go into Ireland immediately and remain there until my arrival, as the state of the doctor's affairs required instant attention. So I, I, I'm really not sure what it would be, again, in 1779 that would require his uh, instant attention at that point. It may be that he was just purchasing the place. I don't know enough. I don't have enough land records. <coughs> okay, let's go on. So, so basically, you know, Dr. Morton was working at the museum. It doesn't say that much about it. Let's see what else I can find in here. Okay. He goes, on. it may be necessary to mention that I also was not to receive Dr. Morton's rents. Uh, Mr. Weatherall of Devlin did that business, and I was to give him what assistance I could to receive my salary from him. He came to Bally James Duff soon after my uncle left and us and paid me ten guineas on account which I was in great need of. But I could perceive he was jealous and there was more intended by sending me into Ireland than was yet avowed. My situation in Bally James Duff was disagreeable enough. I had no horse to ride, etc., etc. Okay. In December I received from the sheriff the possession of Drumrora, Kilnacroft, Coal Hill, Flint. Flinterna, Con Best, and other lands held by Mr. O'Kelly. Now, I'll just hold on for a second here. When uh, Pierce Morton's uh, uh, Irish estates were foreclosed upon in, I think, um, if I have this right, it must have been in the late 17, eight, oh, late 1849s, these, these same estates were mentioned. And then it says, at which these estates reverted to Dr. Morton in consequence, in consequence of O'Kelly's not paying the rent. This is a matter of great joy to me, and, and I now had ample exercise for both mind and body. Okay. <coughs> Dr. Morton naturally thinking the letting of nearly one half of his estate a matter too much of importance to trust in 
to an inexperienced youth, him, having little faith in Weatherall's abilities.